My name's Renee Blackman. I'm a Gubby woman from the Sunshine Coast. Uh, I'm a nurse by trade, and I, at the moment, manage four medical services on the Moreton Bay area for Moreton Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Service. Uh, in my travels, I've been, uh, I started as an Aboriginal health worker uh, way back a long time ago, I'm not going to say when, um, and uh, graduated into nursing, did my nursing degree, and decided I wanted to give back to my community, which is what I've always been doing anyway, because primary health care is my passion. So that took me to a lot of places, uh, metro, as well as out into remote and rural areas like out in Mount Isa and some of the South Burnett as well. And then I came back home to actually do the, uh, the Moreton Bay stuff. So. so the Institute was formed in 2009 by the four member services in South East Queensland. Uh, and that's uh, Attics Brisbane, Newley Burry Bar in the Bayside at uh, uh, Stradbroke Island. Cambu and Ipswich and Calwin on the Gold Coast. The four of those services came together in 2009 with the Institute in mind. Um, the Institute's purpose was to actually bring the region together and start to look at service delivery, knowing we had to do something different for the communities in South East Queensland, knowing they were the same communities because everyone's connected by family in some way, shape or form. And it was also a really quick growth area. Everybody wanted to move to Brisbane. Everyone wants to move to the South East corner. So, in anticipation of that, we knew we had to do something different because people want to move here and that doesn't exclude Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, knowing that we only had six centres, six Aboriginal medical services that were absolutely concentrating on the delivery of primary healthcare services, Aboriginal medical style flavour in our, in, in, in our area, we knew that definitely wasn't enough. Um, the Institute then rolled out some reform measures in terms of uh, governance structures, in terms of service delivery, and we went from six Aboriginal medical services delivering service to 17 currently, which now really, really improves access, um, it improves uh, reach in terms of what people can get in different parts of the southeast. Oh, we share, all of the allied health is shared actually. So the Institute, um, I guess, employ the allied health services and then farm them out to all of the member services. So those 17 clinics are serviced in a way that is equal um, and everybody gets a piece of the pie. So we've got physios, we have um, dietitians, uh, we've got occupational therapy, speech therapists, adult and child, uh, we have diabetes educators, psychologists, social workers, and the list goes on. We've got a, a fair, fairly big allied health contingent that then wraps around uh, you know, a, a, I guess a basis of primary health care in terms of GP services. So Deadly Choices is, is a huge part of what we do in terms of clinic because the one thing we want to, we, we want to promote a message to our community that uh, it's, our clinics are not about sick health checks, if you like. It's not about the end of the cart, it's the front of the cart. So we want to promote prevention rather than a cure because that's what primary health care is about. So um, the Deadly Choices campaigning and the Deadly Choices brand absolutely helps us to promote the well, health, well person's health checks. So it's about saying to people, it, you don't have to wait to be sick to come into Aboriginal medical services. Uh, come in when you're well and we can stay on top of things or even start, stop them before they start, which is, I, I guess, a big part of closing that gap in terms of health inequities across our communities. Um, and it's just good. It, Deadly Choices is also modern. I like the fact that it's modern. It speaks to the younger generation. We have very young populations now, um, especially in this part of the world where I work in Moreton Bay. So Deadly Choices speaks to that generation. The, the, the shirts are trendy, the messages are trendy, the people that run it are young and vibrant people. Um, not to say that older people can't be young and vibrant, because we are, um, but it, it sends a message to the community, it sends a message to the younger parts of our community, let's stop things before they start, and that's what I like about it. We then, as a clinic, wrap around the Deadly Choices message and promote health checks that way. I think the biggest thing is about keeping the, the enthusiasm and the want to keep the flow going. I, 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 it, it's, it's about the enthusiasm for the job. It's about wanting to get up every day and wanting to come to work. So in terms of management, because I always look at management like a coaching position, because I'm a coach as well. So I, it, it's about keeping your team on track and it's about keeping them as a winning team and in a mind frame as a winning team. And I, I don't see that as any different to management. So um, while I've got a really good management structure around me that helps me drive teams and keep them enthusiastic, it's also about me 
keeping them enthusiastic as well. And I think that's the biggest thing. You've got happy people, you're going to have happy customers. And uh, that's really the crux of it for me. You've got to keep your, your staff happy with their jobs and wanting to come to work. So that's the biggest challenge. About 60% Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, and that ranges from our driving staff right through to our medical staff. So we have an Aboriginal dentist that works here with us. We've had some Indigenous doctors that unfortunately weren't from here and had to go home, so that was fine. Um, uh, we've got Aboriginal nurses. Uh, probably of all the nurses we employ in Morton Atsix, 60% of those are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And of course we have Aboriginal health workers and Aboriginal front desk receptionists, which is always important. I probably should talk about the Morton Atsix experience. So yeah, there was yeah. nothing... Traditionally in Brisbane, in the southeast, a lot of the medical services were south of the river, so there was nothing in the northern part of Brisbane, or southeast corner, if you like. So in the northern parts of Brisbane, we had one tiny little clinic um, that was that's situated metro north, so closer to the city. But in this Moreton Bay region, it's the region that sits between Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast. So there was nothing in terms of, I guess, focused Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander primary health care services. When we looked at the population, population here was around 10,000 and that's a conservative estimate because we know not everybody likes to fill out the ABS data. So uh, we thought, well, you know what, we might just try to put a clinic or some sort of a service in this part of the world. Uh, we did that in 2011. Uh, we're reaching probably close to 50% of the population that's here now and one of our clinics in particular, which is the one I was talking about before, experienced a huge growth of over a thousand patients in six months and that's brand new clients and it really is a testament to it. if you build it, people will come. So uh, we knew there were people here, we just had to be smart about where we placed our clinics and that's part of the formula. You don't just plonk a clinic where people can't get to, it's got to be around public transport, it's got to be easily accessible and it's also about smaller. So it's not about building the big Taj Mahals for us, it's about building functional teams that actually are on the smaller side and the very lean side. A smaller team works well, you can manage that better and you can keep that enthusiastic flow going much easier, I find, rather than trying to manage a huge staff of maybe 60 or 70. You break that up into small pieces, it actually works quite well as a concerted effort. Yeah. I actually give them the, Mort the Morton Atsix uh, scenario because before we got here, there was plenty of mainstream services, and they've been here forever, but their own statistics were the telling truth. So we looked at the, the statistics of how many people were actually participating in comprehensive primary health care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I think we counted out of those 8,000 to 10,000 people over the years just before we started our clinics, I think I counted three Aboriginal health checks, which is the beginning of the primary health care journey and the comprehensive care journey for people who are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander who have that, you know, the need for the comprehensive services because of the, the, the prevalence of chronic disease. So I throw that back at them and say, these are your stats. You tell me why, you know, that didn't happen. So, and then I say, so that's why we had to build our own. That's why we had to build our own services. Mm.